Good evening, everyone. A warm welcome to all of you from Chennai. This is Krishnan, along with Sriram and Priyanka in the support team. We welcome you to yet another session in the ICF Coaching for Growth Conclave, which has been going some fantastic, fantastic sessions so far. Uh, and this is the first evening, and uh, I, I can assure you that we have we have had some beautiful time so far together. What we have now is a power talk on a topic that's very, very close to my heart, coaching to navigate crossroads. Let me start before even doing that uh, with a couple of things. One is an apology for uh, a delayed start. There was some technical issue. We had taken some time to resolve it. Uh, sorry for that. The second part is uh, my uh, expression of gratitude to all the sponsors and partners and support teams that are making this event possible as we go on. On the topic, when uh, let me state a few things. When you actually reach a crossroad in our life, we have choices that you make. And the choice makes you rather than the other way. You, we always think that we make the choice, but then the choice actually defines who we are. Making the right choice and being at peace with that choice can often be very, very stressful. So how do you weigh the different options? How do you accept the choices you make while giving up some seemingly important aspects of life? Would you work with a coach if, if you uh, require who, just to make sure that the coach partners you to facilitate some thought-provoking exploration? These are things which come up when we, uh, when we go into uh, navigating any crossroad in our life. Our panel today comprises of two very distinguished ladies uh, who are both from the United States of America out here to deliver their power talks. And uh, let me introduce uh, Whitney Johnson first. Whitney is an innovation and disruption theorist. She's a frequent contributor to Harvard Business Review and MIT Sloan Management Review and author of the best-selling Build an A-Team from HBR, uh, sorry, Harvard Business Press 2018 and a Financial Times book of, book of the Month. That's a Financial Times Book of the Month. And Disrupt Yourself, Harvard Business Press 2019. And I don't know why she missed 2020. Now she's coming up with smart growth, <laughs> how to grow your people, to grow your company. She's, she's one of the 50 leading business thinkers in the world, uh, number 14, named uh, by Thinkers 50. And she's an expert in helping individuals, teams, and organizations to become peak performers. That's our first uh, panelist. Welcome, uh, very, very warm welcome to you, Whitney. Oh, thank you so much, Vicky. I am delighted to be here. And I want to just tell everybody the technical problems were all on me. So you can say I am a disruptor through and through everybody. And I am just so delighted to be with you today. And to your question about what happened in 2021, I was busy trying to figure out how to grow. And that's the topic of our next book, Smart Growth. So here we go. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so you can uh, see. Whitney, Whitney, can I just take a minute and introduce Magda so you can oh, get please. Through. Absolutely. Go for uh, the, it. The second, the second speaker is a, a kind of uh, what I can call as head of family with an ICF. Uh, she's the CEO of uh, uh, International Coaching Federation. Magda brings experience in fundraising, coaching, and consulting and association management. She's the very, very trained professional coach and systems facilitators. She's an MS in economics and international trade from Warsaw School of Economics. It's by uh, Marshall Goldsmith, Thinkers 50. So you can see two people from Thinkers 50 today. And that's, that's a very interesting coincidence that we are having today. In 2021, she was recognized as one of the top 30 global gurus in organizational culture. So I'm going to start this uh, business part of the session by requesting Whitney to speak for about 15 minutes, followed by Magda for a similar duration. And then uh, we, that will leave us about 20 minutes for us at the end for uh, questions and answers and interaction. So I'm going to hide myself over to Whitney. Oh, RKT, don't hide. <laughs> we want to see you. I'm just teasing. Um, all right, let's see if I can share my screen, everybody. And I'm going to move this up a little bit so you can see my face. Um, present to the audience. I'm going to share my screen. Share. And you're going to see a uh, window. Yes, here we go. Share. 
Okay. Now I'm going to go big. All right. So I am delighted, as I said, to be with you uh, this afternoon. And I'm really excited, RKT, for that lovely introduction. And Magda, we've never had an opportunity to have a conversation like this in public. So this is going to be a lot of fun. So what I'd like to do over the next 15 minutes is present to you a framework that I think can be very, very useful to you. I certainly have found it useful in my own coaching, in coaching at a crossroads, um, helping people navigate change. Um, but before I do that, I want to start off by telling you a story. Some of you may recognize this as Machu Picchu. Well, about a year and a half ago, I was invited to speak in Peru. And if you go to Peru, of course, you have to go to Machu Picchu. There is a village that you can travel or, or tour, but there's also this mountain that you can climb. And um, we decided that we were going to climb this mountain. This is where I, I took the picture. Well, started to climb the mountain and it was a hard climb. It took us several hours. At one point, it was very treacherous. Uh, the paths were so narrow that, and there were no ropes, there were no guardrails, there was nothing. So if we had slipped, we would have died. So it was, it was a hard climb. Well, as you surmised, we made it up the mountain and we're going back down the mountain, at which point, a hiker that was going up stopped our guide and asked him this question, is it hard? And then our guide said something that I am probably never going to forget. He said, and I'm going to say it in Spanish first, because I know there are some Spanish speakers on the call. Nunca es problema, siempre es aprendizaje. Which translated loosely means it's never a problem. You're always learning what? We just went up this mountain. We almost died. And you're saying it's never a problem. You're always learning. But like I said, that stayed with me. Because how do we get to the point? I wondered both literally, but more metaphysically, metaphorically, how do we get to the point where we're able to climb that mountain, to climb the mountain of Machu Picchu, climb the mountain of our career, climb the mountain of our life? And what I have found in the work that we've done and the research that we've done is it's a lot easier to climb that mountain when we have a map and when we know where we are on that map. And the S curve of learning framework is that map. And I'm gonna share with you over the next couple of minutes what that is. So many of you may be familiar with the S curve. It was popularized by E.M. Rogers in 1962. We used it. I used to be an investor um, working on Wall Street. I co-founded a fund with Clayton Christensen, and we used it to figure out how quickly an innovation would be adopted. But then I had an aha that you could use this S-curve as a framework to think about the psychology of how we grow, how we learn, how we develop. I realized that it could help us understand whenever we start something new, we are at the launch point of an S-curve. And the S-curve math tells us that even though the growth is happening, it's not apparent, it's below detection. So growth is going to feel slow. You're going to feel like it's a slog. It's going to feel hard. You might feel discouraged. You might feel impatient. You might feel awkward. You might feel gangly. All of that is normal because the growth is happening, but it's not yet apparent. And so that was really helpful because it normalized the experience of I'm starting something new. I feel awkward. It's supposed to feel that way. Now, some just really quick tips as you're thinking about helping people navigate. Well, what do they need at the launch point of that S curve? As you're thinking about coaching, they need things like words of encouragement. They need you to think of this as you're running an experiment. And I'll tell you a story about that in just a minute. They need feedback on what's working and what isn't. And they need to have their inexperience valued. So let me tell you a quick story on running experiments that I think is especially relevant because we're talking about coaching. About six months ago, I was um, asked to do a live coaching demonstration. And so maybe you've done that as well. And I thought, okay, I need everybody to think I'm a great coach. 
And so I got into that demonstration and it wasn't very good because I was trying to perform. I was trying to not be at the launch point because whenever you coach someone live, of course, you're at the launch point. You don't know what you're going to get. And I started trying to perform, which was a very bad idea. So afterward, I went to my coach because coaches need coaches, one of whom happens to be Carol Kaufman, who you all may know. And she said, run an experiment. So I thought, okay, I'm going to run an experiment. So about a week later, I did another coaching demonstration. And I said to everybody, hey, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do live coaching. We're going to see what happens. We don't know what will happen, but we're going to figure it out. Well, I said, sometimes I'm going to coach and you're going to look at me and think she's amazing. She's a great coach. And there are going to be other times where you're saying, hmm, not so good. But that's okay, because then we're going to learn something because we're running an experiment. And so that's what we need to understand is at the launch point, our identity is going to be in question. We're not who we were. We, we are who we are now. We need words of encouragement. It's characterized by overwhelm. And what we need is support. Support. We need to give support as a coach. We need to get support if we're just starting out coaching, for example. So that's the first thing I want you to think about when you're coaching people at a crossroads is what is the launch point of a new venture, a new curve um, in your career or your life look and feel like this is that emotional journey of it's going to feel a little bit uncomfortable. So that's the launch point. Now, let's talk about the sweet spot. So you've been in that launch point. You've started to gain some traction. You were going slow, but now things are starting to feel fast. This is the math of the S curve. And so where it felt slow, it took like a long time to do something, a lot in time to do a little. Now in a little time, a lot happens. So all your neurons are firing. You feel exhilarated. This is right where you're supposed to be. This is the sweet spot. And you obviously want to try to be in the sweet spot as long as possible. That being said, every part of that S curve, every part of that growth cycle is important, but you're going to do your best work when you're in the sweet spot. So what do you need to know as you're coaching your folks who are in their crossroads um, is in the sweet spot, what they need are stretch assignments. They need to be pushed. They can start to get complacent or their manager might say to them, well, you're doing great, I'll leave you be. No, they need to keep being pushed. They also need you to coach them to say no to yes because they start getting super competent. They get lots of requests to do lots of things. They need to be able to focus. They don't focus. They could get derailed off this current S curve. And then what they also need to hear is thank you. Um, things are working because they're there, but they might be a little bit invisible. So in the sweet spot, you want to stay there as long as possible. It's characterized by exhilaration. What people need is focus, focus um, in terms of staying focused on task and also being appreciated and honored. And so that can be coaching for people that are being coached, but also as your coaching managers to help them understand the importance of focusing on people in the sweet spot. Now let's go to mastery. So mastery is a place where growth has started to slow. So you were overwhelmed. Now you're kind of underwhelmed because your brain, it's running these predictive models at the launch point of the sweet spot. You wanted dopamine. You weren't getting it a lot because you were figure thing, figuring things out. But then you got into the sweet spot and your predictive model was getting better and better and better. And so you're getting more and more dopamine. But now that you're at that high end in mastery of the curve, you figured stuff out. So there's not more dopamine because the model's working. And so your brain says, I need something new. I love my boss. I love my company, but kind of bored. So I've got to have a challenge. And so when people are in mastery, what they need is they need to continue to be challenged. And so here are some thoughts. When you get to the top of that S curve, keep climbing. You may be able to stay in the exact same role, but if you're coaching someone who's in mastery and they're feeling a little bit bored and they love the company, they love their boss, they've got to find a way to keep climbing. So it's a summit, but not the summit. The other thing that they can do are these S curve loops. 
it takes a lot of energy, a lot of exertion for someone to go back down the mountain and bring someone along to get their backpack and guide them. And so S-curve loops are a great way for people to continue to grow when they're in mastery. If they're not ready to jump to a new S-curve, that will challenge them. Third thing you wanna do is to create and sustain the ecosystem. If you think about this mountain that you're on, you're climbing up this S curve, you want to know where you are in your growth because when you know where you are, you can affect your, um, your, your capacity to grow increases. You want to have these accelerants that move you along that, uh, along that curve, but you also need an ecosystem. If you're trying to climb a mountain and it's snowing or it's raining or it's sleeting, it's gonna be a lot harder than when the conditions are favorable. And so this person who's in mastery can create these favorable conditions for other people to grow, which takes a lot of work. So in mastery, people can start to get a little bit bored. What they need is a challenge. So this is the framework. This is something that I would encourage you to think about. What it does is it allows your client to say, okay, here's where I am in my growth. I now have a map. I know what steps to take next. It allows them to have a conversation with their manager to say, here's where I am on the S curve. I love you. I love the company, but I'm a little bit bored. I need a challenge or I need a stretch assignment, or I really need some training depending on where you are. It also then helps your managers as they plot people manage um, for succession planning and workforce planning as well. I think that is it. I would love to hear from you. You can email me, wj at whitneyjohnson.com. But this is the curve. This is the framework that will help you help your clients navigate growth, navigate the crossroads when they're at the top of that S curve. What do they do next and what to expect and what the launch point looks like. And with that, I hope I'm under 15 minutes RKT. I will stop sharing my screen and turn it back over to you. Thank you. Yeah, definitely under 15 minutes. You just shaved off one minute out of that 15. Good. Uh, so uh, that goes to Magda. <laughs> so can I invite Magda, please? Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Whitney. Uh, the theme, of course, of a conference is coaching for growth. So understanding where people are in their growth and in their learning is uh, totally a first step for coaches and as you said in the closing uh, comment for your speech to the managers so they can really uh, um, plan for succession and plan for general workforce and we all know that it's not an easy easy time now especially to do that um, so I would like to build on, on Whitney's presentation and uh, just to acknowledge the fact that at every stage, that being either the lounge or the sweet spot or a mastery, one still needs to make choices, right? And uh, choices and choosing could be quite an emotional process, despite all the data we may have that should support us in this decision making. And what it also um, sometimes perhaps is lost on us is that making a choice, one also needs to be at peace with the outcomes, uh, the consequences, sometimes predicted, some, sometimes not predicted, and just being at peace with the fact that uh, possibly not all decisions will be perfect or won't prove to be absolutely, uh, you know, the most efficient or effective. So the, the, the choice is a range of different things that we can choose from, right? And some of these choices could be super easy, such as what are we gonna have for dinner, although I struggle with this one, uh, or you know what I'm gonna wear to present today at the conference. So some may be low impact, and others may really have a very, very significant consequences, that being, you know, what profession to pursue, what place in the organization I want to take, uh, what am I going to do about my children's future, about my, my, my life, my life partners. So choices being based on uh, really multiple influences and having large ramifications. In general, we like to have a freedom 
of choice. If our choices are limited or artificially restricted, then it's bringing a discomfort and maybe, um, maybe some level of frustration. And then in contrast, if we have too many choices and options, that is also a confusion, perhaps re reduced satisfaction and ultimately possibly down the road, a regret uh, of the al alternatives not taken. I don't know who said that, but I love that little quote. And it is that if you choose two rabbits, both will escape. In other words, one has to make a decision, stick to it and be happy with the outcome and react to this outcome. Um, and, and again, at these different stages, as Whitney said, either seeking support, focus or challenge. In making decisions, there are many possible biases that are influencing us. It could be a confirmation bias. We really, really, really want something to happen. So we find every fact on the face of this planet that would support that choice. It could be accepting the very first choice that comes to mind. Uh, it could be unwilling to change our mind, although facts and other um, factors are pointing into a wisdom in different decision. It could be wishful thinking. We really try to see everything in a good light because we want it to happen. It could be temporal bias. Something happened and we see at our choice only through the lens of that bias. It could be group thinking. It could be thinking with or without enough emotion. Um, it could be practical choice because we think that that's what's expected, especially in an organizational setting. It could be uh, neglecting or dismissing and putting aside a spiritual choice, which may be very important in a set of values for an individual. So choice made that way may simply not be um, possible to implement if it's in conflict with personal spiritual values. I think it was it was actually Mahatma Gandhi who said that a no stated from a deepest conviction is better than a yes merely stated to please or worse to avoid trouble. So again, making a choice at any stage of our professional or personal growth is really, really important. And especially if we're at the crossroads, crossroads would suggest that there is an important choice to be made. So this is where we come to coaching. And Whitney already mentioned, you know, what a coach, uh, how a coach may support a client or what the client may seek from a coach at different stages of an S-curve. But using a service of a professional coach to partner in that process of navigating the crossroads helps us blend emotions with reasons, as well as to create that mindset of acceptance of the outcome. When it comes to decision making, a successful coach, as you know, uh, would, would uh, uh, focus on facilitating a productive discussion ask right question, help point out and overcome these biases we talked about. And a coaching process can paint a much bigger picture. You heard me, some of you heard me talk more about the systemic uh, approach to coaching. That is to see a person in, in the entire system that they operate rather than in a vacuum of a specific um, issue uh, or, or, or a process. And also coaching can bring a new perspective, right? So, so people and organization can really greatly benefit from working with the coach. As you know, um, ICF carries out a lot of research and I want to point out to just several points that were brought in through our research, either with PricewaterhouseCoopers or with the Human Capital Institute, that last one primarily focusing on coaching in organizations. As you know, awareness of professional coaching is growing very fast. And uh, when we first did the study with PwC about eight years ago now, um, the, the awareness of professional coaching was at about 50% mark, which we thought was 
fantastic. Right now it's at 67 and we will repeat this study later this year. So this is phenomenal growth and we asked PwC, they, they do this study for many organizations and they could not quite come up with the profession that the awareness of which was growing at such a uh, fast pace. And I dare say that last 18 months um, brought the awareness of, of coaching even more so to the attention of general public. In many parts of the world, coaching was perceived maybe as um, remedial, perhaps even punitive. In other words, you know, if there is a problem, let's bring a coach to figure it out. And, and now that perception changed pretty dramatically. Coaching is a badge of honor. Coaching is a sign that the individual is investing in themselves or the organization that that individual may be a part of is investing in them, believing in them and supporting them in that S curve of the growth and professional development as they progress in their career. Our research indicates that people engaged in coaching are very satisfied or satisfied with their um, with their experience. 86% um, of, of surveyed people said that, and 90 plus percent of them said that they would, the, the ones that were satisfied, that they would repeat the, um, uh, the engagement if given such an opportunity. We also know that organizations with strong coaching cultures are benefiting and enjoying a much greater engagement of their employees and they are also engaging much better uh, financial results as compared to organizations of a similar size and a similar sector. A lot of talk is about, of course, changing guard of uh, who are the primary uh, workers these days and millennials are coming to to the working space, I think by 2025, representing the greatest 75% of the entire workforce. Well, millennials are very aware of coaching and very willing to engage in coaching um, uh, environment and a coaching uh, relationship. So that is something that, again, uh, for the organizational um, human resources and talent development people, that is great uh, opportunity to offer coaching to them as it's almost expected as um, as the means to, uh, to to grow professionally our most recent research with human capital institute also indicates that coaching is one of the most significant support and accelerating force for change initiatives we know so well that so many change that just about everybody is in a change initiative and then that so many of them are actually not successful uh, and the three elements of the success or a failure of the change initiative are actually the very same its leadership its communication and its resilience and again, we all know that coaching can support uh, individuals or teams in um, growing the muscle for, for that new way of leadership, uh, communication and self-awareness and, and resilience. That's what we were talking about, and I know that there are some sessions here at the conference around new style of leadership, what's not only desired, but what's needed. And the call for new leaders is to be very self-aware, inclusive, vulnerable, open and curious, inviting. So again, these are elements that we know can be significantly supported by professional coaching. Team coaching and systemic coaching, again, are, are getting a huge uptake, uh, which also uh, leads to creating and building coaching cultures in a very different way than, than it has been observed before. Um, and let's not forget the coaching is partnering it is confidential it's it's the agenda of the client it's partnering and it's open it's safe so in conclusion why to choose coaching it is because coaching brings empowerment if you look look into a definition of the word empower it could be to give authority or power to do something 
But uh, the other definition I think is much more powerful. It is to make someone stronger, more confident, especially in controlling their life and claiming their rights. Being a coach is empowering to you, is empowering to your client. Receiving coaching is empowering an individual to learn more about themselves, to grow, and to support the growth of others. Coaching empowers individuals, teams, organizations, and ultimately larger systems, dare I say, humanity. We talk a lot as an organization about coaching um, being applicable to individual situations, to organizational settings, but also to supporting social progress and social change. So that empowerment that coaching is bringing in a <laughs> empowerment in a humble way, which some I think is slightly contradictory. I think that's a beautiful paradox. Um, and especially when you are at crossroads, you need that empowerment, you need that support, you need that challenge, you need that focus to make a good decision. Best you can can, best you can do at the given moment and be ready for the outcomes. Empowerment is why one should choose coaching. Thank you. Wow. Amazing uh, speech, uh, Magda. And ending in empowerment. And what I loved uh, parallelly was the fact that Whitney was making notes in the chat box. <laughs> it's just amazing. So uh, I have some questions. But when I, I mean, for both of you, uh, let me uh, start with uh, I mean, being the moderator or sp another speaker. I get priority, so I can ask Whitney the question. Uh, can there be multiple escrows for a single person? Yes, absolutely. Um, before I answer that question, I just want to comment on how the three of us are color coordinated, just for everybody. Coaches are also color coordinated. Magda, RKT, your backdrop, and my blouse are color coordinated. Okay, so there are multiple coordinations and S curves. Yes, absolutely. A hundred percent. I mean, one of the things, if you think about your life, it's actually a portfolio of S curves because you've got, um, you, and it's also a fractal. So you can have your S curve that you're on as a father or as a mother or as a friend, you can have an S curve that you're on in a given role. You might have an S curve that you're on with a hobby. And so part of what you're doing in your life is balancing those S curves. And one of the things that we actually find is sometimes you'll find an employee who they'll say, you know, I've got this person on my team and they've been in the same role for six years. And I keep saying, I want to promote them and they don't want to. And I'm like, well, are they in the sweet spot? And they say, yes. And what's happening is that they come to work, they do a great job and they have other S curves that are important to them outside of work. So you absolutely can be on multiple S curves at the same time. Thanks, thanks Whitney. Uh, still on S curves, Priya Sharma Sheikh uh, says, uh, help Whitney, uh, please help me understand S curve loops a little more. Oh yes, absolutely. I, I, I went through that quickly. So one of the challenges for people who are at the top of an S curve may be saying, you know, I really like this organization. And I actually really like my boss. So I don't want to, and I really like the work that I'm doing generally. So I don't want to change. I don't want to go somewhere else. And I don't even really want to do something else. So, but I still need to be challenged, right? Because I, because I, I need that dopamine. And so an S curve loop, if you think about it, um, we all know that there, it's one thing. So I, I'm a pianist. So it's one thing to be able to play the piano. It is another thing entirely to figure out how to teach someone to play the piano. So if I'm at the top of the, and see people are clapping because they totally get it. So if I'm in the top of that S curve, an S curve loop is, hey, Magda, you're at the top. Whitney's kind of in the launch point, moving into the sweet spot. She needs some mentoring. She needs some tutoring. She needs some sponsorship. She needs some guidance. 
can you figure out how to bring her along? That takes a lot of energy on Magda's part. She's got to figure out how to do it. And so she's got to go down. So she's got to go down with her backpack. She's got to help me get my backpack and pull me up. So it's an S curve loop because you're on the top of the mountain. But you're going down the mountain and coming back up. Thanks, Mickey. Uh, yeah. Question for Magda. Usually people are on crossroads due to a trigger or an event, either in the past or the future, like the pandemic currently. What sort of emotional quotient or emotional strength a coach needs to exercise while coaching someone who's on crossroads, especially in a stressful situation? Mm -hmm. That's a question from uh, Vinita Joseph. Sure. Uh, it, it, is, it is really something that cannot be overlooked right now. And it is the level of stress, the level of um, uh, mental tiredness, you know, um, and, and the well-being. So the flip side, you know, how, how do we make sure that, that we are keeping an eye on, on well-being of uh, individuals we are working with? And may I say, for coaches themselves. Let's just not dis dismiss that group of people, right? That's that's one of my passions. People, take care of yourselves. Um, but um, what is really important is that um, the, there is a definite, definite uh, difference between the uh, need of a support of a mental health professional versus where coaching can be very, very useful and perhaps um, being um, being sufficient to support the person. Uh, Whitney mentioned Carol Kaufman. She just published a brilliant article in Forbes.com about the difference between therapy and coaching. And you know, um, uh, her, her uh, I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing totally. I hope she's not going to be upset with shorthand here. But, uh, you know, basically she says, uh, I love that metaphor. She says, in therapy, you deal with tears and healing. With, uh, with coaching, you deal with dreams and moving forward. Um, so, so for a coach, it is very important to recognize in a client if they are in need of the uh, other kind of um, uh, uh, support, that being um, medical, you know, professional, um, mental health, uh, or is to just make sure to understand the the, the client's um, blocks, the the stuckiness, uh, the the fear and work with those um even if it is you know scenario planning and what's what's the worst case scenario what's the best case scenario and this is i think where where that support part is very important what do you need to move from here on and just for a second uh, i will get back to the fact that coaches really 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 need to take care of themselves because in order to be able to walk down with that backpack and it's heavy God darn it it's heavy and pull somebody up one has to be in a good shape themselves yeah. right so 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 making sure that there is some uh, level of uh, rejuvenation um space to to examine our own um state of mind and state of um um possibility of serving others is is should not be neglected and as you know it is now reflected in our new set of competencies that self self-care hmm. rkt can i just can i jump in for two seconds here yep yep yeah so I, so Magda, first of all, I just wanted to give you a shout out of, of, I, I hope everybody noticed what, how deeply and intensely she listened to what I said. She kept picking back up on what I had said. And I think that's what a great coach does. And I just want to just say, I'm in, in, in admiration at what you did because you just, I felt so hurt. And I mm. think that's what a great coach does is they listen to what a person's saying and then they repeat back to them some of what they've said because they feel heard. And so I wanted to just call that out. I think for all of us who are trying to improve our skill as a coach, I think it's a really, really important skill. And then uh, the other thing I wanted to mention really quickly is I love how you said on this idea of choices, I, I think that's an interesting, and I don't know if you've written an article on this, Magda, but I would love it if you did, is if you said, okay, people, you're making choices. Here are the 10 biases that might be at play. 
And so all of us as coaches can use that as a checklist. All right, you think you wanna do X, let's do a checklist of those 10 biases. I would read that article and I bet everybody else would too. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, this again, uh, let me uh, address this to Magda. Uh, this is my own question. Uh, we spoke about acceptance of her choice. Mm -hmm. More often than not, it's because we uh, go back and uh, think that, yeah, this is the, at this point, had I made a different choice, mm. my life would have been this. And that's, that's the frame in which uh, uh, Kochi comes to us. How does it play for you? Well, I don't remember who, but somebody said, don't don't be too concerned about making choices because in most cases, 50% of them will prove to be wrong. Um, okay. And I think there was Einstein or somebody like that. So it was like, ah, okay, okay. Uh, but I think that what we can do, and again, there is no guarantee. There is there is no guarantee. And then there are surprises and those surprises could be good, right? Is that we do examine the possibilities that we, uh, that, 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 that what we afterwards don't say to ourselves like, oh, if I only thought of that, we, we thought of that, right? We examined these different things. We examined even our own conviction about uh, the acceptance of, of, of the choice and the outcome of the choice. Um, and, uh, and, and a coach, again, in a very, very uh, objective way can ask these questions. Uh, I remember early on when we so had to explain what the hell we're doing being coaches, right? Um, the, the question was like, can I just talk to my friend? I said, well, you know, you want to leave, leave to and move, say, to Australia. Your friend doesn't want you to move to Australia. Don't you think that maybe some of their, uh, what they say to you will take that option as not super viable from you. So you have to have that objective person who also will challenge some of, 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 your, um, of your assumptions. So for a coach to, to, to create that, that safety net of what if, um, is is something that then it's like yeah I knew it could happen and I was fine with that so it happened so okay let's be fine with that mm -hmm. but what also is important I think is that well back to the S curve we're never stagnant unless we choose to be stagnant so so we come to a certain point it appears that we need to do something differently let's do something differently let's not wait till the end of a journey let's find another trail. Right, and this is again where a coach can help. <laughs> wow, that's very interesting. Uh, there is a question which I haven't actually fully uh, uh, grasped. Probably, uh, yeah. Your your thoughts on a coach being human or a human being a human being a coach? Question is from the space of boundaries being defined as a coach, not limited to self care. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Who do you want to take that? It sounds like a Magda question. Okay, Magda will take it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Coach is a human. Uh, and as such, that's the only way the coach can coach another human. You know, uh, remember when we had this issue with uh, term life coaching being not perhaps super well received and uh, we don't hear it. Well, recently we hear it more again, uh, but, uh, but, you know, in a way, every type of coaching is life coaching because we are coaching human beings. And, and if the coach is not, not a human, how can she or he, uh, resonate with another person. Um, I mentioned systemic coaching and that's another big passion of mine and it is we, we never operate in a vacuum. When you come to work you, you don't just magically forget um, your home, your family, your health, whatever it might be. So, so those are the elements that are influencing your actions and your decisions and a coach is 
pretty much the, the same, right? What I find very important, and that's a big conversation in the coaching profession right now, is what is the, the uh, boundary of a coach to accept or not accept um, an assignment? I think mm -hmm. it's super important. Let me give you an example, which is an example from a long time ago, but resonates with me. <clears throat> so there was this lady, she is still an active coach, <clears throat> and she uh, 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 helped a, um, a, a candidate for a political uh, position, and uh, that particular person won. Well, the opponent came to her not much later saying, I want you to be my coach because I'm going to run for another position and you, you clearly did wonders with this other person. And she said, but you understand that I'm of a different political persuasion. And the other person said, well, does it matter? You're a coach, does it matter? And she was like, superhuman of course it doesn't matter i can coach anybody i'm a good coach i have my competencies i'm good to go so beautiful that she said about three months into it she found herself with the gorgeous awareness herself that she was trying to change this other person's political views mm -hmm. that's what she was doing rather than truly coaching him uh, so in a, in a code of ethics, as you know, we do have a standard that says that a coach will recognize the impairment in self and has every right uh, to not work with somebody approaching them and refer them to somebody else. So, so, so I think that we see it more and more um, specifically in that our coach as well late sir john whitmore famously said i'm not gonna coach anybody in the financial sector and i said john but they need you he said yeah but i don't need them it's a, it's a choice it's another choice because a coach you know needs to be the best to offer the absolute best um service to their client so recognizing the humanity in self is i think one of the most important self-awareness study um and and the um the element of the of a coach being a great coach going maybe from a sweet spot to mastery uh with that with that awareness so i'm going to connect that last part which you said to ian banerjee's question if a coach has adequate knowledge of the client's area of work is that an advantage or a drawback for the coaching process, please? I, I can share an experience. I was asked to coach uh, in a particular uh, company and they said one, one reason is because I don't belong to that particular domain. Uh, there are customers who specifically are this way or there are customers who go the other way. Uh, so can I throw this to Whitney, please? Yeah. Um, I have my cat running up against me, so I so if I'm petting the cat, that's what's going on. I think it, it I think it really depends on what kind of coaching that person needs. It, it goes back to it's it's situational because there are certain if you know the domain, I think there is the risk that you can become enmeshed in a way that you wouldn't if you don't know the domain. So, um, so I think what you have to do is just weigh, weigh it out and say, okay, do I know this so well, or is my personality such that my chemistry with this particular client, am I at risk of becoming enmeshed or can I keep back? Um, and then on the flip side, I would say there are going to be times where depending on what the, the, the client needs, where they're really trying to get up the S curve as a domain expert it's not the leadership piece. It's not the soft skills. You may need to recuse yourself because you're not going to be able to be helpful to them. So, for example, a person who really, really needs to do deep, deep stuff, operations, supply chain, needs that expertise. I'm not the right coach. Okay. If that's what they're trying to get done, if it's leadership, probably OK. But I think and I think eventually you self-select. So it's a big depends. I think it, it's can you be effective Will you be enmeshed or not? So that's that's how I would think about it. Mm -hmm. 
If I may add, I think that it is, you know, we have to look from a perspective of what is the client looking for. Yes. If, if, if you don't have that knowledge, the client will not uh, professionally respect you, then it may be a tough sell uh, to work with that client. At the same time, as, as Whitney said, you know, sometimes if you are too uh, familiar with either a position or the, or, or the industry, you may have the very same blind spots as the person you're trying to help see the blind spots. So, uh, so yeah, it, it depends. It could be a very good match uh, and it could be, it could be a hindrance to more uh, eye opening, bigger picture um, conversation. Which goes back to your phrase, gorgeous awareness. I love that phrase. Okay. So thank you. We are uh, almost at the close. And uh, just to summarize, uh, I mean, uh, Whitney, thanks for taking us through the S curve. Uh, I'm just making an advance request. Probably you should spare some time for a, probably a one hour session only on S curve. I mean, considering the amount of interest it generated, uh, that was just wonderful. And thank of you. course, and of course, I mean, uh, I, I, I envy you for the speed with which you were typing notes. <laughs> Seriously, even before I could write, it was actually uh, there. So I, I, at some point, I stopped writing. So that that's oh, the. Oh, okay. Well, you're welcome. I'm glad that I'm <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm booking you for any ICF chapter, Priya. Uh, it could be Mumbai, whatever. But but please invite us. Uh, so uh, a session on ESCA was a request to you. Uh, Magda, listening to you was like, you know, a complete lecture on coaching competencies. I, I mean, I went back to number eight, you know, uh, the one which says facilitate client growth. And mind you, uh, you said you started by saying coaching for growth. You said ESCA was for growth. And then whatever you spoke was on the competency, which actually uh, relates to client growth. And that was something really, really wonderful. So it's been a fantastic uh, one hour with both of you. Uh, can't thank you enough. Uh, while thanking you, let me also thank the support team, which has done a wonderful job. And let me thank the sponsors and uh, the partners to this conclave for making this happen. So uh, it's been a delight. Thank you so much. And I was looking for the word and Priya Sharma, she gave me this. She said, Magda, you're adorable. Oh, I'm adorable today. I liked it. Thank you. So, I mean, so that's adorable square I mean, for both, both the ladies. Oh, oh, thank you. It was lovely being here with me. Always fun uh, being with you. And then, uh, yeah, we have to do it again. Yes. That's the spirit. Thank you. Whitney, a thank last you. word. Yeah. Thank you, Krishna. Thank you for the yeah. organizers.